Let's let's pray first, and then, Certainly. all right. Yeah. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day, Father. We thank you for the blessing of our visitor, Professor uh, McIntosh, Lord. He's, he's provided us with uh, such great insight and encouragement and knowledge and information about your wonderful creation, the intricacies of the design that goes into who we are and why we're here, Father. We are so thankful. Father, we pray your spirit will come and dwell with us today. Uh, Lord, quicken our minds and our hearts to what we hear. Lord, help us to, uh, to embed that into our lives so that we may live lives going forward that glorify you and magnify you as our wonderful creator. We, uh, we thank you for this blessing, Lord, and we ask you to uh, just bless us with your presence here today. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Professor McIntosh. Amen. Thank you, Kevin. You're welcome, sir. Thank you, sir. Well, what a giant of a man Kevin is. <laughs> Lovely to meet Kevin this time that I visited here. I'm going to come down here because I, it's being a... Um, oh, I can't do it. Or maybe I can. Just a minute. I'm just going to slightly alter the way I'm hooked up. Sorry, Josh. Um, I'm going to change my location. I prefer to be down on the floor. Um, no, uh, yeah, you could bring the chair down with that. Yeah, that's great. And I'll I'll reconnect with that. Thank you, sir. You want to be behind the table? Yeah, I'll just be behind the table. Thank you. If you just move it forward. Thank you, sir. Enough. That's enough, yeah. I'll come round. I'm still hooked up. That's good. Then I can refer to the fossils. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, very much. So, um, it's really good to be with you, and I'm going to talk to you about the fossils. Um, and indeed, some of you have seen the fossils here. Um, I've got them all lined up. And if you haven't yet seen them, come and have a look at them. They are here for you to look at. And I've got, for instance, a clam here. So I'm just going to talk about some of the fossils which are on the table. And uh, if I ask you, have you ever seen a, a modern clam? Have you? Have you? Have you been? Okay, so you know what I mean by clam. It is actually like this. Some of you have seen these already lying on the table. I deliberately had them out yesterday. And these fossils, many of them we have today. A clam is an example. We have clams today. But what is amazing about this clam is that it's closed. When you go to the beach, do you find closed clams? No, you will usually find them open. In fact, almost invariably, you will find clams, modern clams, on the beach open because the mussel inside has died, the shell has opened, and maybe a bird has actually prized open the shell and grabbed the mussel inside, um, or else it's died naturally from some other means. So the fact that you find fossilized clams closed tells you two things. Number one, no different to clams that we have today. And number two, were they buried slowly or were they buried fast? Could you shout out, please? Fast. The reason is because Normally, when creatures die slowly or just die a natural death, as I've just said with clams, they are open. So the fact that these are all closed is a very big witness to the brevity of their being buried and therefore the consistency with the worldwide flood. There is another one that you may have seen when I had them up yesterday and I had the, the kids come and have a look at them at one point, and I took a picture of them all looking at the fossils. And um, this is my sushi fossil, because it's a shrimp, very similar to a shrimp that you might have had 
uh, or a prawn or something like that that you might have had at the sushi bar down the road. I don't know whether you've got a sushi bar here in the Mojave Desert. That's probably a bit unlikely. But if you go to Los Angeles or some big city like that, you can go to a sushi bar and you can eat, if you really want, live fish. And I don't like live fish at all. I'm not fond of sushi. It's not my choice. But this looks like sushi that you had the other day because you can even see the feelers on this shrimp. So have some of you not seen these fossils? Not seen them? Anybody not seen them yet? Well, you need to make sure you come up afterwards and come and have a look. And these are great fossils, which I brought. I've got a load more at home. But that, again, tells you two things. Number one, no different to the fossils, no different to the creatures we have today, right, on this one. And secondly, this fossil must have been buried not slowly, but fast because you can even see the feelers on this shrimp. It's a very, very good fossil. I almost lost that once. I almost left it um, when I was traveling. Um, where was I? I was in Texas somewhere and uh, I almost left it at a school. <laughs> but so uh, they, they, they knew how valuable it was and they got it back to me. Now, we sometimes have fossils of creatures that we do have today, like I've just been showing you. And indeed, I've got a fossil fish here. The same point applies. This has fin marks that you can see, and it's from the Green River Formation, um, in, uh, uh, not far from Yellowstone. And this fossil, again, is no different to a modern fish, and it doesn't show any evidence of being buried slowly where it would have just rotted away. Instead of being buried, buried slowly because of the fin marks, it shows you that it was buried fast, okay? So, and there's a dragonfly, the same point applies. This isn't an actual fossil. This is a copy of a fossil, but it's a good example. But you sometimes have fossils of creatures that we don't have today, and this is one of them, where I've got the fossil and the imprint on the other side, so I've got the mirror image. That's a lovely example. That comes from England. That was at Whitby, and it was just lying on the beach at, as a, a little stone like that. But the telltale signs that there was a fossil was on the outside. Somebody got a chisel and broke it open. And that's the fossil. It's a lovely example of an ammonite. It's a twirly-whirly thing, right? A bit like an autolus. Uh, shell that we still have today, but we don't have ammonites today. So this is an example of a fossil that we don't have today, right? But having said that, was this buried slowly or fast? Everything indicates again that it was just caught with a load of water and mud, buried, and then simply died as it was buried. And if you think that that could have been buried slowly, what about this example of two ammonites together, where, frankly, the possibility of that happening slowly is very, very unlikely. This shows, again, that they were buried fast. The last example is one, you wouldn't know this one, this is a trilobite. And th there are many of these found in North Africa. The, I'm going to mention trilobites a bit later, but uh, just to say that that's what a trilobite looks like. It looks like a little worm with many, many legs. So it's not a worm because of the legs, but you could say it's a bit like a centipede, but uh, a seagoing version. And that you can actually get very big trilobites but what is amazing is the eyes of these creatures, which I'm going to refer to later. Also here is something which is a little bit odd. Have you seen this before? What do you think it is? I don't know. You don't coral. know. Maybe it's coral. Coral? Like coral. Well, you got the right letter. 
it's the technical term for it does begin with C, but it's not a coral. Would you like to hold it? Yeah. All right, okay. Now this, anybody uh, would like to just look at this? You see, if I gave you a little hint that it used to smell, would that give you an idea what it is? You'll be amused when you work out what it is. I think some of you here do know what this is, don't you? Yeah? It used to smell. So what was it? It's, it was poop. That's right. It was, it was poo, as we would say in England. It was poo, which came out of the back end of a creature. But it doesn't now smell because it has been fossilized. Could you get this slowly buried in the rocks? No, because with all the water, which clearly has been going on with the burial of these things, because they're all buried in what we call sedimentary rock, that is rock which is made from mud and water, right? It would have just washed away, wouldn't it, right? But then you may have heard what the lady said here. It's not just poop from any old creature. It's poop from a dinosaur. The reason we know that it's a dinosaur poop is that you can see what's inside it and you can see that it's to do with stuff that dinosaurs would eat. And it was probably quite close to a dinosaur fossil. I don't know all the details as to where this came from. But the point is that there is lots of examples of dinosaur poop, right? Which means that actually the poo could not have been buried slowly. It must have been buried fast in order to get this impression in the rocks. You can't. There's no way around this. The dinosaur poo must have been buried actually very quickly. So there is lots of evidence just from the fossils themselves which indicates rapid burial. Kevin, when am I meant to finish? Where's Kevin? Where's Kevin? He's disappeared. The giant has gone. <laughs> ah, there he is. Kevin, what time am I meant to finish? Right, OK. I'll make sure that I'm over uh, in the region of 10.15 uh, 10 then. The service is at 10.30, is it? Yeah, OK, thank you. Right, so just to give you some idea as to uh, what then really did happen, clearly um, we, we could go into lots of other examples of fossils. But let me just bring, out, bring to your attention other fossils which I haven't brought with me because some of them are, of course, in prized possessions in museums and I can't bring them with me but at least I can refer to them by showing you pictures of them for instance this is an interesting one buried some oh oh the power came out maybe that no I don't think it's the power not sure what's happened that's there. Not sure what happened. So that's back. Oh. Oh, here it is. No, it's 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 me. It's it it's it's just I hadn't pressed the right button. Thank you. Uh, it's Claire, is it? Lisa. Lisa, yeah. sorry, Lisa. <laughs> well, you can have, have it as well. We'll call you Claire as well, yeah. right? Lisa Claire, she's got a new name. Okay, thank you, Lisa. So, here we go. So, this is another example of a fossil, this time in amber, which is hardened resin from a tree which has oozed resin, right, and encapsulated in this particular example, a feather. Now, the feather doesn't look any different to what I said yesterday about modern feathers, right? That the modern feathers have hooks 
and barb uh, hooked barbules and ridged barbules. Remember, some of you came to that yesterday. I won't go into it again. But there are barbs coming from the main rockets, which is coming down from uh, the main rockets is going from the bot uh, top right or, or the side right to bottom left. And then coming from the rockets, which is the stem, are barbs. And then in between the barbs, there are hooks coming over one side and ridges coming from the other side. That's the same arrangement as a modern feather. So there is no evolution, even though the amber, if you read the writing underneath, is supposed, but obviously I don't accept this, right, is supposed to be 99 million years old. Do you see what I'm saying, Lisa? Can you see written at the bottom? Oh, I should say Claire, your new name. So um, to written underneath, it says 99 million years old, which I don't accept. But even if I did accept it, there is no difference between the feather today and the feather in the past. How about a fossilized butterfly? Here's a modern metal mark butterfly. And there is, an, there is one in the rocks, which uh, looks very much like a metal mark butterfly. So there is no evolution of butterflies. We could go through all sorts of fossils and we could put up what's called the geological column I'm not going to go into too much detail here because I just want to get one main point over about fossils and then I want to move into dinosaurs, as the title said. But you can see that there are various names given to the rocks, which I don't have any objection to, right? We do see different types of rock all over the world and classifying the rocks is a good thing to do. But that doesn't mean that the rocks were laid down slowly. If you go to the Grand Canyon, an awful lot of the top part of the geological column is lost. Okay, I'll show you a picture of the canyon in a moment. But the bottom layers are still there. And yes, you can see what's called the Cambrian and the Ordovician, but it's, sometimes you've got whole layers missing in one particular area. But so, but I'm not against an idea of layers, but I don't agree with the millions of years, which is what I've put down there, is the traditional view. I don't accept the millions of years. Neither do I accept that there is a progression of life from sea creatures going all the way up to man. It's hardly surprising, though, that you get a lot of sea creatures buried if, because it talked about the fountains of the great deep be what started the flood. And it talks about five months before everything was finally covered of the tops of the mountains as they were then. If you read very carefully Genesis 6 to 9, it talks about 150 days before the whole of the world that then was, was covered. So we don't, we're not surprised that there's a lot of sea creatures buried first. Just mentioned to you that there are other fossils like damselflies that we have today buried in the rocks. And this particular one has lost its wing, but nevertheless, it's clearly a damselfly. Then there are other examples like dragonflies, right, which are found in the rocks, which are no different to dragonflies that we have today. There is no evidence of real evolution of these creatures. Indeed, the fossil dragonflies are buried much lower down in the rock. So really it means that dragonflies have not evolved, even if you were to take the ages which are listed there. <laughs> so you can sometimes play the evolutionists at their own game and say, well, okay, let's Let's suppose that the rocks are this old. I don't accept that, but let's suppose that they are. You don't actually see any evidence of evolution. How about these plant fossils, where the plants don't look any different to the plants that we have today? Indeed, think this through. If I was to pluck some flowers for Mother's Day, okay, and we've just had Mother's Day in England, you have it at a different time, but if you, doesn't matter what it's for, but you're going to give some flowers to your well-beloved or to your mother or whatever, and 
you pick them and you leave them lying around for a while. What's going to happen? They're going to wither. And they're not going to be much good for giving to mum or giving to your well beloved. She'll say, you giving me those? You know, all drooping and withering. Very quickly that will happen, won't it? So how then did those ferns make an impression in the rock? There's only one answer, that they must have been buried slowly or fast. Fast. As the mud came down on those layers, and which included plants, they made an impression of the plants. And there's a lot of impressions of plants in the rock. So there is no evidence of evolution. Here's a, a sycamore leaf. And it doesn't look any different to a modern sycamore. So it's the same point. There's an awful lot of stuff buried which is very similar to what we have today. And when actually you analyze it very carefully with x-rays of this particular fossil, you actually can see the original pigment is still there. You can even get an idea as to the coloring that was there in this supposedly 50 million year old leaf fossil. I don't accept the date. I think the evidence is, number one, that there's no evolution of the plants, and number two, that actually these ain't that old, they were buried fast in the flood. Some fossils contain even bits of DNA, and you can even sometimes smell the, the fossil as it is opened. You can actually even smell plant material, or sometimes it's animals that are still smelling having been buried. In this case, the DNA amount that is left in the plant fossil can be linked with how old it might be because we know from modern measurements as to decay of proteins with DNA in it, we know that after so many years, it will gradually disintegrate. And by knowing how long it will take to disintegrate and knowing how much is left, we can estimate how long the plant has been there. And it comes out, as you can see, if you look at the writing closely, you probably can't read it from there, but it actually says somewhere in the region of four to four and a half thousand years, which is exactly what you would expect from the flood. So shale fossils actually know not only indicate no evolution, this one is from Idaho, but they also indicate rapid burial and not so long ago. There are other fossils like fossils of octopuses, or maybe I should say octopi, because I'm dealing with a number of them, but then that would indicate you're having octopus pie, and I don't think I particularly would like that. But uh, you can even see the arms of the octopus in this fossil. That's not indicating any evolution at all because it doesn't look any different to a modern octopus. And again, when you put this on the chart, it's indicating that really there is no evolution of these creatures. So now we come to creatures that we don't have today. I know you'd like to hear about dinosaurs, which I'm going to refer to, but I also want to refer to the trilobites, which I mentioned earlier. These creatures we accept are extinct. We don't have them anymore. So let's briefly talk about trilobites, then I will talk about dinosaurs. Trilobites are buried usually in the very much the lower layers. So it would be Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, those layers. But the remarkable thing about trilobites, and it's not so obvious on this trilobite which I've brought with me, I've got a super example of a big trilobite at home that my wife gave me 10 years ago when we had our 40th wedding anniversary. This year it's our 50th and we're planning to 
come over and visit uh, a few places over here, actually. But we're going to do that later in the year. Uh, so we've been married 50 years. So praise the Lord for that. That's our golden wedding year. But uh, I don't think she's going to buy me another big one of these. But the big one that she bought me 10 years ago, it was so big, she wanted to give it to me while we were away. So we had to go through security with this big thing. And I didn't know what it was. And uh, she had it in her hand luggage. Not a good idea. <laughs> and they went through security. Beep, 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 beep. And so, you know, they took her to one side and they said, you know, what have you got in there? And obviously they were worried about uh, something like a bomb or something. And so there was quite a lot of delay. And we got the flight all right, but uh, uh, it was quite interesting. So... Uh, anyway, she gave me the, this big trilobite fossil. Now, you can see the interesting thing about trilobites is their eyes. Their eyes are not made of protein. Protein is basically what our eyes are made of. You can push into your eyes and you know that you've got soft material there. Sadly, when you die, the eyes decay like all the rest of your body and that's just what life is. We are made of living material which decays when we die. So don't dig me up. There's no point. You'll just find a skeleton after I die. Okay, you won't find anything interesting in my eyes. But with trilobites, it's different because their eyes are multi-lens, like the lens of a dragonfly. Okay, a dragonfly has many, many lenses. Right? I think I've got a, trilo uh, a, a dragonfly eye here somewhere. Um, uh, no, maybe I haven't. Um, no, I, I do sometimes show a picture of a, a dragonfly. I, but it's not too different, actually, to that picture there of the trilobite eye. It's actually a very bulbous eye for a, for a dragonfly eye. Okay? But unlike the dragonfly eye, which still has each of the individual lenses made of protein, not so with the, um, with the trilobite. Its eye, each of the lenses, is made of calcium carbonate, and it's called calcite, which is CaCO3. Calcium, Ca, CO3 is the, um, is, is the carbonate. Now... Natural calcium carbonate looks like this, which is a crystal, right? So it's each of the eyes, and there's hundreds of them for a trilobite, is made of mineral. But the thing is that the mineral, which it's made of, calcium carbonate, and let's have a look at the closer picture there. There's, there's a close-up of the lenses. It... Each of the lens, each of the crystals, if it was just natural calcium carbonate, so what you see on the screen is what I'm holding, is it's got a property that it produces a double image because the light which comes in two planes, right? Light comes in two planes. So, so if you have a polarized, polarized um, if you have Polaroid lenses, some of you do for sunglasses, it takes out one plane, which is pretty good work, you know, for reducing the glare. So, in fact, um, you, could, you, you could actually put a laser into these lenses and you would see that the trilobite was not seeing two objects at the time. In other words, it wasn't seeing double. Why, do, why does calcite produce two images? Because the plane of the light, which is horizontal, is bent at one angle, and the plane of the light, which is vertical, is bent at a different angle. So you actually get two images. If you were to put on your Polaroid lenses and look at this, you would just see one image. That proves it. But there is one central axis which, if you look down it, 
and the way you look down it is to get look at the wide angle of this crystal and go look at a very shallow shallow angle and you could get the two images to come back together again because there is one special axis in calcium carbonate which brings the two images together now the central the central axis of each of these lenses right if you were to take that out and put it with a you know look at it carefully and if you were to look down the central axis of that lens you would find that the central axis of every one of those lenses is exactly this special axis that I've just talked about. Sorry, it's a bit of a complicated point, but it means that every one of these lenses is so carefully built that no trilobite needed to go to the optician. It was going to see only one object even though the lens was made of calcium carbon, carbonate. Have you understood, Lisa or Claire? I'm following. You're following. Right, you're with me. Yeah. Right, so it makes sense. So, question, were trilobites simple elementary creatures? No. They were very complicated optical masters. They could see using very complicated optics and they could see extremely well indeed. So there is very little evidence that trilobites were busy evolving even though they are extinct. Let's move on to dinosaurs because we all, the kids particularly like dinosaurs. We all like actually the amazing story about dinosaurs because we Naturally, people think that they are wonderful ancient creatures which are prehistoric. No, they are not prehistoric, but they are wonderful creatures. They are extinct. That is, we don't have them anymore. I've talked to you about the worldwide flood. Did Noah take dinosaurs onto the ark? That's an interesting question, isn't it? Some of you are saying no, and I clearly heard, heard a yes as well. In which case, you're a little slightly confused. Well, some of you might be slightly confused. The answer is yes, because dinosaurs were made just like other creatures in the six days of creation, according to the Bible, all land-breathing creatures would have been taken onto the ark. But it's not surprising that the creatures outside didn't make it, did they? Because that was the whole point of having the ark, that you preserve two of every kind, and of the clean animals, it probably was seven, when it says sevens, it was probably seven pairs of those particular creatures, but usually it was two of each kind. So there'll be two Apatosauruses, there would be two, uh, <coughs> uh, what's the other one, Stegosauruses, and two lots of sauruses, right? So you'd have lots and lots of dinosaurs and all the different types of dinosaurs on the ark. You might say, well, there's not a ro enough room for them. Well, we'll come to that. There is actually enough room, but let me just deal with the fact that there are dinosaur fossils. If you go to Spain, and in the middle of Spain, there is what's called the Pyrenees Mountains, which are between France and Spain. There is a place where many examples of a dinosaur are buried, along with turtles and crocodiles. That's interesting, because turtles and crocodiles are, of course, things that we do have today. So, let me just be clear that dinosaurs are usually found in what's called the Cretaceous rock in our geological column. I don't accept, and I'm reminding you, I'm not accepting the millions of years, but I'm just using it as a reference for argument for those who do believe that, right? Dinosaurs, I accept, have become extinct. We don't have them anymore. 
But at Lohueco, I said crocodiles were buried with dinosaurs and turtles. What do you know about crocodiles? Fearsome creatures. Oh dear, I don't like crocodiles. I don't, yeah, what do you know about crocodiles? Exactly, so it's telling me that the crocodiles, which we do have today, also existed at the time of the dinosaurs. Well done, that's a very good and important point. And when I went to Florida, I went to Gator Park, which is full of alligators. Oh, fearsome creatures, huge things. Not something I particularly want to get close to. They start off wee and very tiny and look cute, but frankly, their jaws become massive and are hugely dangerous, as we all know. Did you know that large crocodiles are found underneath the Sahara Desert in Niger? Sometimes the length of a double-decker bus. Massive, massive creatures. But they are still recognisable as, guess what? Crocodiles. So crocodiles were busy giving birth to crocodiles and hey presto, they still gave birth to crocodiles. And they went on giving birth to crocodiles. And they carried on giving birth to crocodiles. And crocodiles have been with us for a long time as crocodiles. They weren't changing into anything else. But they are buried, as I pointed out, in some places with dinosaurs. Those crocodiles are there, right? And they are the same. So we got the same point that I made earlier. They haven't changed, which is what I was saying about the fossils to begin with. Now come to the dinosaurs. You can sometimes find skin of dinosaurs buried. And of course, that indicates rapid burial, like I was saying before, no evolution. But remember this, with the crocodiles, sorry, with the dinosaurs are crocodiles. So what's the message? Yeah, dinosaurs became extinct, but the turtles are with us. I'm not going to go on about turtles, but of course the, the turtles we find in the rocks are very similar to the turtles we have today. And the crocodiles are no different to the crocodiles we have today. Maybe sometimes their size, that's the only thing. And crocodiles, of course, don't stop growing. The big reptiles, they just get, go on and on. And if you've got lovely warm conditions, lots of food, they'll become gigantic, which they are, in the rocks. So, conclusion, those dinosaurs, yes, they became extinct, but they didn't, weren't in the process of evolving. They just simply were buried along with other creatures, which we do have today, and eventually the dinosaurs died out in the post-flood world. Well, that then raises issues as to how old the rocks are. My position, as you can see, is that everything was buried at the flood, but that dinosaurs and other creatures, two of every kind, went onto the ark. Let me just say this. We find dinosaurs carved on rocks which are used for buildings like this temple in Angkor Wat in Cambodia, where clearly it's a stegosaurus. That means that dinosaurs not only went onto the ark, two stegosauruses went onto the ark, but two stegosauruses came off the ark and multiplied just like all the other creatures. And for a long while they were doing quite happy until it became apparent that there was not so much food available for these creatures. And so they began to die out. And that is the lesson that most of us think is what we gain from this study of dinosaurs. Clearly, Angkor Wat is about, it's somewhere in the region of about a thousand years ago when it was built, maybe a bit longer, okay? So it's in Cambodia, and clearly people were seeing these creatures. In the Bible, in Job chapter 40, it describes Behemoth, which eats grass like an ox. His strength is in his loins. His force is in the navel of his belly. He moves his tail like a cedar tree. In the margin, it says, could be rhinoceros, possibly. In your, the margin of some of your Bibles, it says, could be an elephant. 
Have you looked at the back of a rhinoceros recently? Not, wouldn't recommend going too close. Or an elephant, again, don't go too close, but it has a squiggly little tail. Yes? Amazing creatures, but no tail like a cedar tree. But an apatosaurus could well be what Job chapter 40 is referring to. It is almost certainly referring in Job chapter 40 to Job seeing a dinosaur. So God's speaking to Job saying, I made dinosaurs and Job, who are you to argue with me about all these creatures that I've made? I am the creator. And you know that a bit later on, Job repents in dust and ashes. Even though he was a godly man, he realized that he was wrong to accuse God for all his troubles. There's a big lesson, of course, in the book of Job. So dinosaurs were land animals which were created on day six, just like all the others. Two apatosauruses, two stegosauruses, two of all the other sauruses went on to the ark and Noah had a saurus time, didn't he? Looking after all these wonderful creatures, which some of which wouldn't, would come off, all of them would come off the ark, but wouldn't necessarily last bit like other creatures didn't last till today. I would have loved to have seen a dodo, but dodos have become extinct. Your American pigeon has become extinct. There are quite a number of creatures which have become extinct, and dinosaurs are just part of that series of extinctions. Here comes something interesting. In bone marrow of a T. rex, Tyrannosaurus rex, which is not a sauropod but walked on two legs, had small uh, forelimbs. In the in the uh, uh, in, in, in the in the thigh bone of a of a T. rex was found in the fossilized bone marrow which contained meat, which was still possible if you were a dog, I'm sure a human being won't want to eat it, but you could, could even have eaten it. It was still spongy and soft. That is an incredible find. That happened by the research of Mary Schweitzer. And she said, isn't it amazing that soft tissue could have lasted 65 million years old? That was her conclusion. I don't think she was right, because actually the soft tissue indicates that it is young, and it's not 65 million years old. So most of the people who looked at this, yes, came to their conclusion that the soft tissue actually had lasted for that long, and they make an argument for the soft tissue lasting for millions of years, but everything is indicating it could not, even in very cold conditions where it was buried in Montana. Here's another shocker. There are different systems for measuring the ages of rocks. Before I come to carbon-14, which really decays very fast, let me just give you a few principles about radiometric dating in general. You have a parent element going to a daughter element. You don't know what the original ratios were. I'm using an illustration of a sand timer clock. It's not that you got that in the rocks. I'm just using that as an illustration. You understand? Right, Lisa understands, so uh, I'm addressing her. But do you all understand? Yeah, right. So it's an illustration. I'm not seeking to be patronizing, but I want to carry you with me. So most of you understand this idea that you've got a parent element, which is like this sand clock, moving into becoming a daughter element. The complications of radioactivity, I don't want to go into. But illustrations of this, or, or sorry, an example of this would be uranium going to lead, potassium going to argon and other systems like that. 
actually it's a very, very long time that's needed even to get down to half its original value. We call those times the half-life, okay? And half-lives of uranium going to lead is measured in millions of years. Similarly for potassium going to argon. Similarly for rubidium going to strontium. Those are the typical radioactive systems which are used. But you don't actually know what the original uh, conditions were. So you've got no way of knowing whether the rate of decay might have altered. That is a possibility. Or that it may have started with the sand clock with a lot in the bottom already. Um, how do you know? You just don't know whether it started with all in the top. And you've got the other possibility of additional material being put in or other stuff being leached out, particularly when you've got a lot of water going over the rocks. So you don't actually know with radioactive dating how old things are. People think that you do, but you don't. And then when it comes to carbon-14 going to nitrogen, that decays by comparison much more quickly. The time taken to come to half its original value is not millions of years. Get this, Professor Libby showed when he first proposed this system, that carbon-14, and he showed this by experiment, carbon-14 decays so quickly in geological terms that 5,000 years, it's already at half its original value. It's actually 5,700. Okay? So, after double that, which is 11,460 years, half of a half is what? Half of a half is a quarter, right? Well done. Very good for a Sunday morning. If I take a half of a quarter, what do I get? An eighth. Well done. That's so, you're really very clever this morning. That would be after 17,190 years. I know this is not biblical. I'll come to that in a moment. If you divide by two again, yes, a sixteenth, very clever. You get to 22,000 years. Now, if I divide by two ten times, tell me if you're a computer boffin, and some of you are, a computer buff, you know, you're really good at computer science. You know that if you divide by, if you've got two to the power ten, what have you got? Yeah, well done. 1,024. We call that 1K, right? Because it's 1,000. So if you've actually done 10 half-lives, so you've got 57,000 years, 10 times 5,700. Lisa, is 57,000. Right, you're with me. So 57,000 years, you divide it by two ten times, two, two ten times, so... Roughly, how much have you got left? One over a thousand. A thousand. Which means that it's all gone, basically. Now, understand this argument. If, if basically, you've got... Uh, if basically you've got nothing left, it means that... If you were to find something with carbon-14 in it, it cannot be older than the time taken for it to have nothing left, which is 57,000 years. Have you understood that argument? It only applies to carbon-14 because it decays so quickly, right? Now here comes the real powerful punchline to this. So please wake up if you're asleep, right? By the way, carbon-14 is formed by cosmic radiation bouncing against nitrogen in the upper atmosphere. The nitrogen has the same molecular weight as carbon-14. Carbon really wants to, to be carbon-12, okay, but it actually what happens is that it de decays back to nitrogen. But don't, don't get too hung up about the formation, but we know how it's formed in the upper atmosphere, okay? Now here comes the punchline. 
Dinosaur bones have been found repeatedly with carbon-14 in them. Hence, those bones with carbon-14 in them cannot be older than 57,000 years. Have you got it? And 57,000 is nowhere near 65 million. The order of magnitude is way out. Okay, so you say, but Andy, that's not biblical. You're right, it's not biblical. But remember I said that cosmic radiation forms carbon-14 in the upper atmosphere. It could well have been the case that before the flood, the cosmic radiation was not forming so readily carbon-14 in the upper atmosphere because you were living in a pre-flood world where possibly there was a lot more water vapour there and the conditions were far better and were possibly, by the way, instrumental in making people live an awful lot longer, right? Which they did. Methuselah lived to... Well done. 969 years. Almost a thousand. Noah, it was in what year of his life that the flood came? Oh, you're a bit hazy on this. What year? 600th year of his life. So these were pretty old men, and yet they didn't look old because they were still in relative health. So, therefore, we would suggest to you, but we don't know, that the amount of cosmic radiation hitting the upper atmosphere, or getting through the upper atmosphere rather, was not a lot. And therefore the pool of carbon-14 was a lot less. And as soon as, as soon as you break that assumption that the amount of carbon-14 that the creature was taking in, right? I'm taking it in now. If you were to dig me up later, yeah, you wouldn't find my flesh, I said later, so don't bother. But uh, but if you were to examine my bones, and frankly, I'm not bothered because I'm with the Lord, which is far better, okay? But if you were to break up my bones, you would find carbon-14 in it, which would enable you to work out when I died on the basis of the pool of carbon-14 we have today. But if the amount of carbon-14 was less in the upper atmosphere before the flood, then these times that I showed you here of... 30,000 years, 21,000 years, etc., all done on the basis of the amount of carbon-14 which is in the atmosphere today, assuming that it was the same in the past. If you break that assumption and say that there was less there, it collapses down to biblical timescales. Wow. It's a very powerful point, this. Because you've already won the argument because you can say to a person who's a skeptic, they cannot be more than 57,000 years. That's a major win. Do you get it? You don't look as though you're awake. Hands up those who are awake. Hands up those who've understood the point. Oh, oh good. That's not bad, including Lisa. Well done. Claire, sorry. So, there we go. Do you see that there is a major argument here? That you can win straight off the bat that it's less than 57,000 years. But actually, the second stage of the argument is that once you say that the amount of carbon-40 was a lot less in the past, and there's a good reason for saying that, it collapses down to biblical time scales, three or 4,000 years. Wow. So friends, dinosaurs went on the ark, dinosaurs came off the ark, they died off, but they didn't then um, as it were, recover. They were found on the ark, so they would have been on the ark, but they didn't then uh, survive a lot after uh, having come off the ark. One very, very last point, because we're almost at time. I would recommend you going to the Genesis Apologetics website of Dan Biddle, because there he talks about dinosaurs and there is a film that he's produced on Noah's, Noah's flood and the dinosaur fossils in America. Let me just play this clip. Have you ever wondered how the massive dinosaur kill zone in the middle of America happened? 
We're talking about three countries, 14 states, and a stretch over 1,800 miles long and 1,000 miles wide. Okay, you have to look at that in more detail, but that just gives you a taster. Dinosaur fossils are found all along that region to the east of California here. And it's very, very interesting, and it matches what you would expect. That is the basic point of that film. And I would like to suggest to you that the evidence is very strong that dinosaurs were buried primarily in the flood, but two of each of the dinosaurs went into the ark. If you go to the Ark Museum in Kentucky, it looks like that. I happened to visit on, on a rainy day, and it was a great time with my wife. That was some years ago. I've been there since on a better day, and they've got all sorts of displays inside. Can I recommend that you go to it? What is the message then, primarily of the rocks? Judgment. Judgment. That is the message of the rocks, the fossils, and the dinosaurs. Noah's Ark. Please don't have your, the top view of Noah's Ark. That wouldn't have lasted five seconds, let alone a year, which is what the Bible records. Noah's Ark was 450 foot long, 45 foot wide, and uh, the dimensions um, are 30, uh, 30 cubits, 45 foot wide, and I've got the 75 foot, 75 foot wide and 45 foot high. So it's a very large structure. We don't know how Noah could have built it, but we have some pretty good idea from reading Genesis 5 to 10 that there was a lot of expertise in brass as well as in wood. And Noah would have used men who knew what they were doing. Sadly, only his family got onto the ark. And of course, the message really is, as I said, judgment. Just as the Lord you buried the whole world in water through the flood, I got the the, the computers giving up. Uh, then it also sorry, I, I I've got a little bit of a problem here. It hopefully will recover. Uh, oh dear, it's not recovered. Oh dear, I'm not sure what's happened here. Oh dear. Oh dear, I'm going to have to just end it. The computer's given up. Not quite sure what's happened. Um, don't know why I can't get out of this. Something's gone wrong. No, it's not a battery. I'm sorry. It's, it's something else has gone wrong. Uh, it's just suddenly given up. Um, uh, control. Alt, delete. Something just suddenly went wrong. Um, um, I can't get out of this, so I'm going to have to stop. Okay, look, the, I was just going to put up a comparison. We must finish. 2 Peter 3. The word that brought the flood is the same word that will bring the end of all things, which is the time when Christ returns. So there is a very important lesson from the flood. 2 Peter 3 says, the word that brought the flood is the same word that will bring the judgment to come on this world. So the message is that I was going to bring to you was, have you got onto the spiritual ark today, which is, of course, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you trusted in him? So may the Lord bless you all. I trust that you will see from what I've been saying, the importance of taking the fossils seriously and taking the real message, which is believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, that you will be saved. May God bless you all. Thank you. I hope you don't mind. I've just taken a picture to record it because I do like to give a, 
you know, report on my visits to other churches. I won't take questions now if you don't mind, but if you've got a quick question you want to ask after the service, that's the time to ask me because we've got to move into the service now. Kevin, sorry I went over time, I had a problem. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Just want to let everyone know that uh, we do have snacks. There's some donuts back there and a few extra sandwiches uh, from yesterday from this weekend. So uh, help yourself in between. And uh, thank you, Professor McIntosh.